we face a serious risk that American democracy as we know it will come to an end in 2024. Those are the words of Richard Hassan, who will join us today to talk about his new book. Richard is, in many respects, a lawyer's lawyer and a law professor's uh, professor. Uh, currently, he serves uh, as the um, Chancellor Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California at Irvine, though we will soon join the tenured professorial ranks at the University of California School of Law in Los Angeles. Richard is a distinguished scholar, scholar in many ways. He's the author of a leading casebook on election law and co-author of a casebook on remedies. He serves as a reporter for the American Law Institute. He's published scholarly articles in the leading law reviews. He publishes the highly authoritative uh, election law blog, and he is the author of no fewer than five books, the latest of which is Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics and How to Cure It. It's published by the University of, uh, by, published by Yale University Press. Finally, and by my personal measure, there is something of a Louis Brandeis quality about Rick in how he so skillfully combines his passion for the law with his remarkable insights into how to make it better. Richard, welcome to today's salon. Seth? other two panelists today. Um, I first want to start with Laura Edelson and then I'll I'll turn to Alex who's going to moderate today's discussion. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about their professional accomplishments, but most of what I have to say is a little more personal than that. Um, I have gotten to know both uh, Laura and Alex very well over the past 18 months. Uh, I have had the privilege of representing Laura and one of her colleagues from uh, New York University in a, in a dispute with a little company called Meta, some of you might have heard of, um, who has come after them about the way in which they're studying uh, disinformation on the Facebook platform. Um, Laura is a uh, recently completed her PhD from NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, she's an engineer by trade um, and has been a forceful advocate for uh, the study of disinformation and misinformation uh, in all sorts of fora. Uh, this dispute has uh, gotten the attention of regulators, of legislators at both the state and federal level. Um, and in fact, she's in Washington. The curtains behind her are actually in Washington where she is uh, in, in meetings on this very subject uh, over the next couple of days. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think the last thing I will say uh, is that when one as a litigator uh, inherits a dispute, uh, you always wonder what kind of person and uh, your client is going to be and will they be a good witness and a good a client and uh, because that part is already cast by the time you get the case and, and Laura is really at the top of the heap among uh, all of the clients over the, that I've had the privilege of, of representing over the many years uh, in that respect. Um, and so when the, the subject of today's salon came up in, in my discussions with Ron over uh, disinformation and misinformation, it seemed only appropriate to invite Laura to participate, and I think uh, she'll add a lot of perspective to today's conversation. Welcome, Laura. Uh, let me turn, if I can, uh, to Alex Abdo. Uh, many of you already know Alex. Uh, he is the uh, inaugural litigation director of um, uh, the Knight First Amendment Institute of Columbia and uh, has been instrumental in many of their leading cases, uh, including, for example, uh, the case against uh, former President Trump, who was blocking his critics on his uh, at uh, real Donald Trump Twitter account uh, and, and made a law on that subject in the Second Circuit um, uh, and, and many others, including on this one, uh, where Alex, who is, uh, I will say, much more technologically minded than I am uh, and therefore uh, much better uh, capable of, of keeping up with Laura uh, and her colleagues at the, the Tandon Engineering School, uh, has really be, been a joy to work with and partner with uh, on this case. Um, I have been practicing law more than 30 years, and it has been one of the high points of my, uh, this collaboration has been one of the high points of my practice over that uh, many decades. Uh, welcome, Alex. And with that, I will turn it over to Alex to uh, begin our uh, session. Ron and I will turn off our cameras, and uh, thank you again, all of you, for joining us.
Thank you so much, Ron and Seth. And thank you, uh, Seth, especially for that generous introduction. Um, the feeling is mutual. And I um, am really looking forward to today's conversation. We really have just two stellar uh, 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 discussants to talk about uh, the question of our times, which is uh, disinformation. Can we combat it? And can we do so consistently with the First Amendment? It is an existential question uh, if you believe uh, you know, Rick's new book, Cheap Speech, which we'll be discussing today. Um, and just as a reminder, we're going to talk for about 50 minutes. And at around, uh, around 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to open up the questions. We're going to take questions live, so you'll get a chance to actually talk. I don't think you'll appear on video, but you'll get a chance to actually speak your questions. Um, and I'll tell you how to do that when we get there. Um, uh, but for now, we're going to start with Laura. Um, Laura, you've been studying disinformation for many years now, so maybe you can start off by telling us why you're studying it, what are the challenges of studying it, and what would make your job easier? Uh, wow, that's a lot. Um, I study disinformation because I think it is one of the most important public health crises of our time, and I think that it's a problem that I, as a computer scientist, if I want to think about, you know, how can I use my skills to, you know, to best serve this world in which we live, solving this problem, this is it. This is the most important thing I can be spending my time on every day. That's why I do this. Um, in terms of, you know, what do I need to do, you know, to do this, to do my job, um, I need data. I mean, if you ask any scientist, any epidemiologist, how are you going to figure out what causes this this illness? How are you going to figure out, you know, how this disease replicates? You need data. You need to do studies, and you know you need to follow the scientific method, and that is why so much of my work, you know, was initially focused on trying to find new ways of getting data, and now it is trying to uh, continue to get data, but I, this is why I'm also now thinking about, you know, how we as a discipline can, can get the data we need in order to do the work that we all need to do. The sooner I can get back to that, the happier I'll be. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let's, let's uh, bring you in, Rick. So, um, as has been mentioned, you just published this horribly depressing book, uh, which I recommend to everybody, um, called Cheap Speech. So what, maybe you can, you can jump in by explaining what do you mean by cheap speech, which is a term that you attribute to Eugene Volokh. Um, uh, what can be done about it? And, and in particular, what can be done about it that's consistent with the First Amendment? Thanks. I mean, nothing sells books like saying it. <clears throat> that's a depressing read. Uh, uh, it's, actually a cheer, it's actually a really easy, I mean, it's a cheerful read. It reads really easily. I mean, it's, it's horribly depressing in your account of the problem. I should say that, but I, I really enjoyed the book. Thanks. And let me thank Ron for that generous introduction and Seth and Ballard and everyone for the opportunity. And, and I'm thrilled to be here with Laura, who I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the work that she's doing. Um, so, uh, as you said, this uh, phrase cheap speech comes from a 1995 law review article that uh, Eugene Volokh wrote for the Yale Law Journal. Uh, he was talking about the coming information revolution. Uh, he it was a very prescient article. He could foresee things like Spotify and Netflix, that we'd have all of this information uh, available to us. And importantly, that there would be new ways to communicate without intermediaries. So back in the 1990s or, or early 90s or before, if you didn't like something that appeared in the New York Times, you could write a letter to the editor if you were extremely lucky and uh, you know and, and had, had a really um, uh, interesting point of view. You might get published in the Times. Otherwise, you could know, you could stand on a street corner, you could tell your friends, but you didn't have the ability to share information. Uh, Eugene saw that this was going to be very democratizing. He thought that American democracy would do well uh, without these intermediaries. And so, by cheap speech, he means cheap that is inexpensive to disseminate and to share. Uh, and um, uh, that, that all of that is true, and there are many benefits uh, of this new era, including the fact that we have the information of the world in the palm of our hands, and that we do have lots of means of self-expression, uh, and that we can share information. And you know, sharing videos of uh, police brutality helped to 
uh, foment the racial uh, justice protests uh, that we've seen over the last few years. So there definitely are these benefits, but cheap speech has a dark side as well. And I should say that my book doesn't look at the effects of cheap speech across uh, all of society, but in particular in terms of election legitimacy and the ability of voters to have accurate information to make electoral decisions. And by cheap speech, I mean also in the second sense of the word that we have an information market problem where the uh, the kind of quality, high quality information that we need, investigative journalism, particularly at the local level, which can help voters make decisions to hold politicians accountable, that information is still very expensive to produce. But the economic model that supported local journalism has fallen apart as first classified advertising and then other advertising moved to Craigslist and Facebook groups and to Google and to Amazon. This is where the advertising dollars go. Uh, very expensive to produce this cheap speech. The economic model has caused it to be very hard to um, uh, uh, get uh, this information out to the public. And at the same time, uh, changes in technology have made it very easy to share misinformation and disinformation. So you could create a website, uh, and we've seen uh, allies of the political parties and even foreign countries do this in the United States that look like local news, but they're actually propaganda or worse. You know, they're trying to. Uh, steer you directly to to disinformation for either political or pecuniary purposes. So the second meaning of cheap speech is that we're in a system where low valued speech has an advantage over higher valued speech. And I'll just say this so that I don't uh, drone on and on that, uh, you know, one of the first claims I make in the book is that the events of January 6th and the fact that millions of people believe the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen is a direct result of these changes in technology. Donald Trump was able to go to Twitter over 400 times in the 19 days after election day, spreading the false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. I make the claim that if we had the same polarized politics of today, but the technology of the 1950s, it would have been much less likely for this to happen. We wouldn't have had the insurrection in the Capitol, and it would have been uh, you know, not a situation where today even more people believe the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen than I think believed it in the period right after the election, despite all reliable evidence to the contrary. So we've got this major problem with our election legitimacy uh, when so many people don't believe we had a fair election last time, and that has lots of implications for whether we can have a fair election next time, as uh, Ron alluded to. Laura, what do you think accounts for you know the easy spread of disinformation? You've spent a lot of your you know recent time focused on micro-targeting, you know, uh, ad targeting, and the ability of advertisers to reach really small audiences. Um, you know, is that an do you view that as you know, I don't know whether you've read Rick's book, I don't put, put you on the spot, but you know, there's cheap speech and then it's there's an ad targeting. Yeah. It's an element, you know, um, Rick, when you were talking about cheap speech, I mean, to me, the inevitable analogy is fast food, right? I think what is so powerful about the content that is, that is most engaging is that it very often has this very high emotional register, right? Because that's what is engaging. Um, and it's it's often negative. Um, I've also uh, been going back through some of Facebook's own internal research that came out uh, in the Facebook papers over the last couple of days for for some other work, and uh, it's it's really quite striking how how consistently that finding is the um, the negative sentiment, the high emotional tone. And the reason that I bring this up is you know you were talking about the sort of the loss of local journalism and how expensive that content is to produce but it's it it isn't just in the sense that it's 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 not just at a disadvantage because it's expensive to produce it's at a disadvantage because it isn't um you know it isn't yellow journalism and actually that kind of really inflaming um you know make bold claims and fact check later that approach performs really really well on platforms that have content uh, promotion algorithms that prioritize engagement. So, you know, Alex, you asked specifically about micro-targeting, and I think that's a really important part of this sort of the, uh, the toolkit of advertisers and people who wanna spread mis and disinformation, because identifying audiences who are gonna connect with that stuff, that is a really big part of how you get, you know, a new, 
piece of disinformation off the ground, right? You find your super spreaders, you find the people who um, aren't going to question what you think and, and uh, or sorry, they're not going to question what you say. They're going to, they're going to react emotionally. So um, micro targeting can be really effective for finding those kinds of audiences. But I do think that it's, you know, one part of the overall constellation of problems, we'll say. Do you want to respond to that? I have, I have a question for you, but do you, do you have any response to that? Well, you know, one thing I would say is that um, you, part of what my book tries to do is come up with solutions to the problems of cheap speech. And you would come up with different solutions if you think that it's a supply problem or a demand problem. And, and it's some of both. And, and by, you know, by, uh, by a demand problem, I mean that some people want this disinformation because it does serve these kind of emotional needs. And that uh, hearing that the 2020 election was stolen might be emotionally more satisfying than hearing that your candidate lost the election and that the views didn't uh, of of your candidate didn't represent the views of of most voters or or, or of a, a or a majority or a plurality of voters. And so, um, uh, in the book, I analogize uh, the information market to the this famous article by economist George Akerlof, for which he won the Nobel Prize, a market for used cars. And, and it's almost as if people want to uh, a demolition derby. They want to buy the worst cars possible. And so you'd have kind of a different view as to how to solve that problem. Because if you're talking about actually changing people's preferences, that's a lot harder than saying, as I do in the book, um, providing voters with more accurate information can help them to make better decisions. Well, I mean, this is something that comes up a lot, right? Particularly in how platforms themselves talk about this problem, because if platforms can frame this as a, as, as you put it, a demand problem, this is just what people want. Well, then they're not responsible. Platforms aren't responsible. People are responsible. And I think whenever I hear this, it just strikes me as silly because, right, we had, you know, the first insurrection since the Civil War. That is what happened uh, not that long ago. And I just don't believe that like people are fundamentally different than they were, you know, 10 years ago or a hundred years ago. Uh, and yet we have seen quite a few very negative effects that we can trace back to, frankly, the, you know, the largest online platforms, right? From some of the effects um, between social media use and teen mental health. Uh, that is one, you know, the kinds of just like the, the, incredible spread of mis and disinformation through our society in the last several years and how it shaped beliefs beliefs of, you know you've talked about some of the beliefs around the election i would also point to some of the beliefs around vaccines um those are really really frightening i think it is frightening the way uh frankly extremism is back out in public and how it can occasionally go, go viral on on these largest platforms and let's say let's just say hypothetically actually no let's let's not make it hypothetical this is actually a thing we know from psychology and from behavioral economics people react to enraging content it is engaging you know the fact that platforms have made systems that tap into that so that they can in turn sell that engagement i mean that strikes me as maybe not healthy and i realize that there are and that's what we're here to discuss real profound First Amendment um, intricacies and complications that we have to, to manage. But I mean, I think just on its face, if you want to if you want to say, is this a supply problem? Is this a demand problem? Well, either way, it's a problem that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. So to a certain extent, like, we still need to solve it. And we have solved it for other mediums. Like we solved it for radio. We solved it for television. We can do it for this, too. Let me just jump in with. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. I was just going to briefly say that um, in addition to um, the, uh, uh, the the concern about people receiving the information, the other thing that cheap speech does is it dramatically lowers the search cost for people to engage in political action. And so we know that from the Facebook files that Facebook groups were places where uh, people who were interested in advocating violence found each other and were able to connect across the country and you know be able to show up on january 6th when donald trump put that uh, you know series of tweets up saying come it'll be wild you know so it wasn't just about people's ideas it was about 
being able to organize for political action on those ideas. And potentially, I think the country came much closer to a disruption of the peaceful transition of power than a lot of people recognize. Uh, I mean, the 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 threat of uh, of uh, either capturing or killing our political leaders because of how people are able to organize uh, should not be minimized just because it turned out luckily to have been unsuccessful. So, so let me get you both to respond to you know related questions. So I think what the conversation has revealed and the broader conversation around the role of social media and public discourse reveals is that there is some. I'll say lively discussion of how best to understand the role of the platforms in the influence they have on our society, on our elections, on public discourse. And to my mind, that you know, that points to the need for greater information, which is the work that you know Laura has been working on. So let me ask Laura first. You mentioned earlier that you need data, uh, and that you know that one that's one of the main impediments to your work is more data. So maybe you can tell us about uh, you know the recent obstacle you faced in collecting the data that you need. And then Rick, I'd love it if you could uh, help us understand whether the First Amendment would permit legislatures to address the problems that Laura has faced in her work. So maybe Laura, you can start off and then you know, Rick, maybe you can respond. Um, sure, so I very specifically focus on the spread of harmful content in like the large public public spaces online. So I have work, I've done quite a bit of work on ads, uh, specifically Facebook ads, trying to understand how uh, misinformation spreads via ads. And I've also studied how uh, mis and disinformation spread in organic content. But my focus is solely on how this stuff happens in public spaces. Um, because I, th I, I just actually think that that's more important. Um, I think it is a real it is a it is a tragedy that extremism uh, thrives in private. It is a it is a like active threat to democracy when it thrives in public. Um, so the problem that I ran into is first Facebook was unwilling to share even this public data um, in the in the way that we needed it and the volume that we needed it with with my team or, or anybody else. Um, and when I went to set up a project to try to collect it independently via a, a browser extension, uh, Facebook uh, first threatened me with a cease and desist letter and eventually terminated my Facebook account, which is how I accessed their, uh, the, the data streams that they do make available to researchers. And, you know, um, I think I am personally at a point where I really believe that I have done every single thing I possibly can to try to convince Facebook and other platforms to share more data voluntarily. I really think we're at a point where we need regulation to require uh, more public transparency of particularly ad data, but probably other, you know, other publicly available data as well. Yeah. That's sort of what you were looking for, Alex? Yeah. And in particular, you know, so there are You've made a couple of proposals, Laura, that would make your your job easier. One of which, um, you know, one of which is to limit the liability that researchers like you could face for violating Facebook's terms of service. But the second of which is the one that you jointly published, I think, with uh, folks from Mozilla, calling for yeah, maybe you universal could just ad transparency. That. Yeah, yeah, maybe you could describe that. So one of the one of the papers that I published through Knight's um, occasional paper series was a, a technical standard for universal ad transparency. It is it was literally a, you know, here was a standard you could follow to make all of your ads transparent. And it was also a call for for platforms to do that and for for regulation to be or, or leg legislation to require this if platforms didn't do it voluntarily. So that's that's sort of the proposal in brief. Rick, what do you think? Well, is there a constitutional way of mandating that sort of transparency? Well, yes. Um, I, I want to make two points. First, let me respond directly to yours, and then I want to talk about how this is not just a platform problem, and I think we can't think of it that narrowly. So, uh, I certainly support um, Nate Persley's. Uh, Nate, Nate, per Nate is a friend of mine. He's a professor at Stanford, one of the leading scholars in both election law and in thinking about. Uh, law and technology. And he's uh, proposed federal legislation that would require this, I think, as a matter of consumer protection. I mean, put the election aside. Uh, Laura mentioned 
uh, teen mental health. I mean, I think there are a lot of reasons why, uh, and think about vaccine um, misinformation in health. I think there's a, there's a you know a lot of a, a lot of um, congressional power to be able to uh, you know whether that's under the commerce clause or or uh, uh, you know, other other reservoirs of congressional power uh, for requiring that this information be turned over in, in, for researchers uh, in, in a way that both protects the uh, trade secrets of the platforms, but that also provides uh, valuable information. And, that, and that's one of the many proposals I, I raise in Cheap Speech. I think it's kind of an easy First Amendment question compared to some of the other questions uh, raised in the book, like, can you stop Donald Trump from calling the election rigged or stolen? But I did want to just step back for a minute and, and make the broader point, because it seems to me that Fox News is a bigger problem than uh, Facebook in some ways. And that's all part of cheap speech. So cheap speech is not just about platforms. It's about the fact that we have uh, a decline in journalistic standards and a, an increased ability to share misinformation through uh, television uh, as well. Uh, so there's just a lot of, uh, in thinking about how we respond to these problems, you know, if Facebook went away tomorrow, I don't think our polarization evaporates and I don't think misinformation stops spreading. So we need to think about this question more broadly. And certainly, Laura should get the data, but we've got technological change on top of polarization. And the polarization is such where one side is anti-science and attacking institutions that help with truth telling the free press the judiciary the fbi the opposition party the same party that the person's at like you think about every entity that serves to validate what the truth is it's under attack so we have a much broader problem here than just a problem with the platforms yeah yokai bankler makes this case really well um, particularly in, in network propaganda if you haven't read it which i'm, which I'm sure everyone has um, you know, but I think what is really difficult here and sometimes um, winds up dividing dividing people is that I, I actually think both of these things are problems. I think that, that the fact that you have, right, let's just take a look at what is happening this week, right? It is a real problem that Tucker Carlson has talked about, you know, the Great Replacement being a real thing. It's also a problem that that, that content goes viral on Facebook. and ultimately we kind of need to solve both of those problems and the worst part is that they feed on each other and and to a certain extent they are tapping into some of the same things you know so, some of the same things in human psychology that 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 like to gawk that you know want to pay attention to things even when they're clearly not healthy and you can know that and you still will comment on something because you want to say i think this is really problematic and that in turn feeds the beast and you know, I, I think this is one of this is again one of the things that's really hard is is you are absolutely right. You know, if Facebook were to go away tomorrow, none of these problems would go away. But I do think that they are often gasoline on the fire. And I think that's where like I just want to figure out that piece of it, but we are gonna have to solve all of these other things as well. No doubt. Rick, just to get you, you know, more your more specific thoughts on some of the uh, laws that are out there. Because if you look at the landscape of what uh, proposals have been made, you see a real an understandable hesitation on the part of regulators to try to direct, you know, directly regulate um, the fire accelerants uh, to, to you know, carry forward with the metaphor. Um, you see instead proposals being made uh, to go after what may be low hanging fruit, which is transparency about these accelerants. Um, and, uh, you know, you said a second ago, you think it's an easy First Amendment question, uh, 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 you know, for Congress's ability or a state legislature's ability to mandate disclosure of certain additional information. And I just want to, you know, tease that out a bit more. So, you know, one of the cases uh, that some court watchers have viewed as an early bellwether of how transparency laws may fare uh, in the courts is the McManus case out of the Fourth Circuit, which was an involved an effort by um, uh, Maryland to uh, modernize its campaign finance laws by requiring uh, uh, large platforms, which included media organizations, which included newspapers, uh, to uh, 
turnover advertising, you know, political ad information or um, uh, information relating to political ads on their platforms. And it was held to be unconstitutional uh, by the by the Fourth Circuit. And I should note here that um, uh, Seth represented the Washington Post and other media organizations in challenging that law. Um, wh what do you make of that decision in particular for the constitutionality of you know, ad disclosure laws or efforts to modernize campaign finance law? Well, first of all, let's talk about how outmoded current disclosure laws are. So today, if you're watching uh, television and you're seeing an ad that is promoting a candidate, but not not saying vote for the candidate, and that ad is coming to you through um, uh, Spectrum, your your cable provider, or it's coming to you through DirecTV or Dish Network, it's subject to certain disclosure laws under the McCain-Feingold law, under parts that have have not been struck down as one another one was yet today by the Supreme Court. But if that same ad comes to you and you're still getting the signal coming through your 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 cable, but it's giving you an internet signal, uh, but you're watching it on Hulu or on YouTube TV, or the ad appears embedded in a in a Facebook ad or or a Twitter ad, there's no disclosure requirement for that advertising uh, uh, because um, uh, Congress has not uh, politically had the will to update the laws so that it takes into account technology. And, and that seems to me to be a ridiculous system as more and more of our advertising is coming to us through the internet. I think it's perfectly constitutional under existing precedent to require that those ads, if, if you can require it be disclosed on TV or radio, you should be able to require it to be disclosed on the internet. Um, and if you have such a law, then you don't need the kind of law that Maryland passed, which was targeting the website owners. Don't target them. Target the people who are spending the money, you know. And, and I believe there should be a a very generous um, dollar threshold. I don't want to go after the grassroots people who are spending a little bit of money. Uh, let them have. I, I don't think you know that it would be necessarily be unconstitutional to require disclosure of their spending, but I think it doesn't serve an important social interest. Uh, so it shouldn't require. Uh, Disclosure, but if you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads to try to influence how people vote in elections, that should be disclosed by you, the spender. Or if you're giving it to a committee by the committee, you don't need to involve the Washington Post or Facebook. So there are ways to deal with that disclosure without involving the platforms. I, so again, I think that's easy. The reason I'm concerned that it's not going to happen if Congress passes it or there might be a constitutional problem is because of the Supreme Court's recent decision in Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta, which just to remind you was a case that Supreme Court decided last summer, not even on campaign finance, but uh, but on a related uh, question about disclosure to government uh, entities, the way the court redefined the exacting scrutiny standard, which applies to disclosure of campaign finance ads, makes me think, and comments from Justices Alito and Gorsuch and Thomas in the past, make me think that there could now be a court majority that's going to turn its back on laws that go back even before Buckley versus Vallejo, which have upheld the disclosure of campaign finance laws on grounds that they, one, can prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption, two, can provide voters with valuable information about who is trying to influence their behavior, and three, can help to enforce other campaign finance laws like the ban on certain foreign spending in elections. So under current law, I think there are easy constitutional ways, again, to do this. I'm not sure the current law is going to hold. Uh, when it comes to those questions. And I would say, last point, the same thing uh, about my proposal that so-called deep fakes, these are um, manipulated audios or videos that can make a politician look like uh, he or she is saying or doing something that they're not in an embarrassing way or something like that. I think those could all be required to be labeled as altered under um, current Supreme Court precedent. But, um, you know, given the compelled speech option, that's not a slam dunk. And given the... Um, mostly but not fully libertarian orientation of the current Supreme Court. I, I'm not convinced that these laws should be upheld, and I worry that the Supreme Court's going to be an impediment to effectively countering disinformation should Congress get its act together and actually try to pass some laws to do that. Laura, if you, if you, you know, I don't know if you have reactions to that. Um, uh, well, let me give you a chance to react. I think one of the things that is so hard is, you know, when I think about so, so to be really clear one other thing i should mention about my my proposed universal ad transparency standard is it would only apply to the largest online platforms because 
when we when we look at like where the real problem is it's not the washington post it's it's facebook and instagram and youtube and one of the real issues i i absolutely hear um you know from several people the interest in placing the the disclosure responsibility on the spender what is really difficult about that is very often some of the things that we really need to know that are potentially very problematic are only knowable by the by the platform where the ad is delivered for example um when advertisers, when people who want to spend money on ads want to uh, deliver an ad on a large ad network, they give the ad delivery network a fair amount of discretion about who that ad is shown to. And people often talk about, you know, micro-targeting in terms of what the advertiser, like the narrow group the advertiser wants to display an ad to. What gets less attention and I think should get more attention is uh, discriminatory ad delivery. If a platform decides that a certain group is less likely to click on an ad for financial services, then they won't show it to people of that group, even if that group is a protected class. That's a problem. That is a real problem. And it's a problem that we just can't detect if we only ever see the uh, targeting criteria specified by the advertiser and not the not the um, not information about how an ad was delivered. And that's why, you know, just leaving it at the spender just doesn't quite get us there uh, for all that it is is appealing in many ways. I think that's one of the there's other things I could say, Alex, but a lot of them come back to that where you know a lot of the information we need is is fairly complicated and there's thorny issues in just about every layer of this and and that's why typically people are saying, yeah, we just need the platform data because ultimately, you know, that final mile is where so much really matters. That final mile of like delivery to the user, I mean. Rick? Yeah, awesome. no, I was just going to say that um, you know, one of my other proposals uh, is that uh, campaigns not be allowed to target, micro target campaign ads uh, at all, um, which would solve this problem. Um, it, of all of the proposals in the book, um, it does raise a um, a question about uh, you know uh, whether or not uh, uh, there is a, a First Amendment right to be able to micro target information. I tr I try to analogize it between a campaign that ordinarily collects demographic data about um, potential people that they might want to send information to, uh, you know, by just observing like with a camera to being able to use a kind of um, uh, mind reading machine, which is essentially what um, the platforms are able to do given the amount of data that they're able to collect. And I, I should just point out, you know, in particular, uh, I, I take on Facebook's um, uh, lookalike function where you can give uh, the names of some people and their email addresses or their phone numbers, and Facebook will find people using its uh, data, a uh, vast data source, to be able to target ads to them as well. And that strikes me as a very pernicious practice that can uh, allow for manipulative advertising to be sent to a, a smaller um, you know, subset of people, at not only allowing um, the platforms to speak out of both sides of their mouth, but also uh, allowing for uh, potentially misleading advertising to be sent in a narrow way that wouldn't get the same attention if it were sent to say everyone in a member of Congress's district. Yeah, this is this is really hard, and this is where I feel like as a scientist, I I just can never have as much fun as anybody else, you know. Because the thing is that one thing that is pretty observable in the data is that um, harmful and deceitful advertisers. You know, however you want to, if you want to talk about consumer fraud, if you want to talk about misinformation, if you want to talk about almost any slice of advertisers that kind of we all agree are bad, um, there is a disproportionate reliance on particularly behavioral and interest based targeting. And this is because typically they don't know, like they don't already know their customers. They don't, you know, have a have a customer list that they're going to go back to again and again for for again, fraud and misinformation. They're always looking for, for new customers and, and that's why there is this over-reliance on this. The problem and the reason that I have never said, hey, I think we should just ban micro or anything like this is I know that there is plenty of other, you know, honest advertisers who are, you know, just advertising their products There's, who use micro-targeting. There is heavy use of micro-targeting um, by people who want to do things that we would all think are socially beneficial. 
and my case in point here is um, something that was really interesting when we monitored the um, the Canadian election in um, in 2019 is one of the top spenders of political advertising in Canada is um, Elections Canada. They spend a lot of money just promoting voting on telling people uh, where their where their polling place is, just very basic stuff like that. And they had a very unusual demographic and uh, gender distribution, they had a very unusual age and gender distribution of spend until we realized that they were targeting uh, groups that had low voting rates. And then I thought, okay, that makes sense. It, they're fulfilling their mission, they're definitely micro-targeting, you know, but there are good reasons to micro-target. And what I don't know, and like, I just don't have the data, maybe the, I, I honest to God don't know, I don't know if it does more harm than good. And I'd really like to have a handle on that before I before I were to call for, you know, we should allow this, but not that. And and that's why I kind of just say I just need the data so I can do the science so that then we can start making recommendations like that that are based in in evidence. And just to be clear with my proposal, it would not apply to something like Elections Canada, it would only apply to advertising that mentioned the name of candidates. And so it wouldn't, it's, it's not a general ban on micro targeting. But if you're going to be mentioning a candidate in the period close to the election, uh, then you should have to send that message to, you know, to everyone who um, is, you know, a potential voter for that uh, candidate as opposed to a subset. One thing you flesh out in your book on that proposal, Rick, maybe you can talk about is why under kind of very traditional free speech theory, that ban might make sense given. Um, uh, you know, given the reliance on counter speech as the antidote to bad speech and micro targeting of electioneering communications kind of depriving the public of the opportunity for counter speech. Maybe you can walk through that argument. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big believer today. And again, I'll use the 2020 election as, as exhibit A, exhibits A, B and C. I'm not a big believer that counter speech works. We've had a lot of counter speech about how the election was fairly run and yet it doesn't seem to have done the job. Uh, but even if, if you do buy into the counter speech argument, um, the, there's no public repository where someone can say, okay, um, this is the ad that went to, you know, white rural men over the age of 50. Uh, and this is the ad that went to, uh, you know, young Latina women living in cities. And, um, you know, and then you can, uh, if you are the candidate on the other side or you have an interest on the other side of a political campaign, you could then target those same people. Uh, you know, a lot of this is happening um, privately and there, there's no way to know. You know, it goes back to Laura's point about the lack of information about what's going on. You can't have counter speech when uh, there is no... Um, uh, ability to know who is speaking and what they're saying. You know, this is a bigger problem. We've seen this uh, on encrypted apps like WhatsApp, uh, where or WeChat um, uh, platforms that are uh, there is no public uh, availability of information about what messages are being sent. They're often used by immigrant communities, and the messages are not in English. And some of these messages have been found to be contain a lot of misinformation and and have you know trying to scare. Uh, potential voters into particular things. Counter speech can't work in that kind of environment. It's not like someone has published, you know, traditionally, you know, an op ed in the local newspaper and then people can all respond to it and the truth can magically rise to the top. Um, I should just note that uh, Google actually agrees with you and Google has prohibited, uh, you know, it's a fairly narrow list, but you're allowed to target by zip code and uh, age and gender, and that's it for electoral advertising on Google properties now. And I, I think, just to be clear, like I, I think that that's the right call. Um, I, I personally think that we know that micro-targeting is very powerful. We don't really know how to make it safe right now. And in the in the space of that lack of knowledge, I think it is it is very reasonable for for. Uh, particularly that kind of narrow targeting of such a rule to say, like, we just don't think this is safe. And so we're going to not allow it for right now. So I, I want to ask you another question. But before that, I just want to let everybody else know that in about five to seven minutes, we'll probably start taking some questions. Uh, and you can start lining up now if you want uh, to. The way to do it is uh, if you look at the lower hand, uh, lower right hand 
corner of uh, the WebEx box, there's a button that says participants, click on participants if it's not already showing. And you should then see also in the lower right hand corner, uh, a little raise hand icon it looks kind of like this. Click on that and I think I should then see you in the queue and I'll do my best to call people in the order in which they raise their hands and you'll be unmuted and we'll have a chance to ask your question uh, live, um, but feel free to start queuing up. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to, to come in, though, I'd love Laura and, and Rick both if you could uh, talk a little bit about the left-right dynamics of disinformation. So there's a tendency, at least in um, uh, you know, the news outlets that I read, to characterize disinformation primarily as a problem on the right. Rick, you, you, you know, provide a number of anecdotes in the book about disinformation on the left. Laura, in uh, you know, some of your research, you've documented disinformation on the left. Um, maybe you can both talk a little bit about the left, you know, the left-right dynamics of disinformation. Uh, Laura, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can. I can go first. So um, I did a study in which we just tried to understand. We were, we were really focused on trying to understand the way misinformation specifically spreads on Facebook when compared to more factual content. So we we effectively just collected all all public news content on Facebook for the. Mm, call it the nine months leading up to inauguration, the inauguration day in, in 2021. And what we've found is that misinformation is just, it's a lot more engaging than factual content. And when, but the process of doing this, we had to disentangle the effects of misinformation from the effects of partisanship. Because one thing that is, I think, very clear to everyone is that uh, most misinformation is right-leaning. And so, you know, are we seeing more engagement with misinformation because it's right leaning or because it's misinformation? We have to be able to, to separate out those two things. And when we do that, um, what we find is that misinformation is just across the board more engaging. However, um, it is just much more prevalent on the right. Um, if you were, to, if you just say like, how many news outlets are there that are, are far left, are slightly left, are center, slightly right, far right? Um, they are, they take up a, they're, they, they are just a small handful. They are a tiny percentage, less than 10% everywhere except the far right. And um, if you look at overall engagement with news content, only on the far right, do they make up a majority of engagement? However, giant asterisk, the other place that they make up a notable amount of, of outlets and of engagement is on the far left. I think of. I think the right way to think about misinformation is as a problem of the political extremes, not a problem of one side or the other. Because again, like when we look at slightly, slightly right, slightly right content looks pretty much like slightly left content. It doesn't, in terms of the misinformation mix, in terms of engagement, it really is, um, to get back to the horseshoe theory of politics, it's really something about that political extreme, whether it's right or left. So I, you know, I, I think that that bears my reading of where things are as well. Uh, again, point to Yochai Benkler's work, um, who finds this asymmetry. And I think you can't separate out this issue from the current political moment and how Trumpism depends in particular on spreading misinformation uh, as a means of trying to um, uh, counter uh, the uh, opposing political forces, right? So if the claim is, uh, you know, that Trump is corrupt or, or breaking norms or breaking the law, uh, the answer is to say that those who are saying that are not telling the truth. Uh, you know, so if, uh, if Trump lies more, then the fact checkers are going to find more, you know, four Pinocchio situations to use the, the Washington Post fact checker model or pants on fire, right? More claims are going to be tagged as false. Um, and so if a fact checker or if um, content moderators at, at a platform are even handedly enforcing rules about truth, but there's more false information coming from the Trumpist right, then more of that would be tagged. And in fact, one of the things we saw in the 2020 election uh, through the Facebook files and elsewhere, is that Facebook in particular 
bent the rules for what would count as a strike, what would count as misinformation that was being spread, because it would have targeted much more people on the right, because they were worried that that would show political bias. So applying a rule even-handedly where, where there's asymmetry in how much people are willing to share false information looks like bias. And the way to counter that is to have a biased rule so that you look even-handed. And I think that's a real problem for um, content moderation and for fact checking today. It's not though. It's not a problem for content moderation. It's not a problem for fact checking. It's a problem for corporate governance, right? All the fact checking in the world won't help you if you have someone at the top who knows in advance what they want the answer to be, right? That is the problem. And the what part of, the thing is that fact checking won't save you from that. And, you know, but, but I just, the reason that I, I sort of push back on that is that people act like this is anyone else's fault, right? The reason that Facebook has a problem here, that Meta has a problem here, is because of Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg controls what, uh, 57, 50% of the shares of Facebook, and this is just what he's chosen to do with his company, which is his right as the largest shareholder. And, you know, no fact checking, no content moderation policy in the world is going to save you if the person who runs your company, who makes the decisions here, if this is the platform they want to run. So, I, I mean, I think that we still need all of those tools. We need all those things, but then we also need, you know, corporations to be accountable. I 100% agree with that. I, you know, I, and we, we haven't gotten into this about the Texas or Florida laws, and maybe that'll come up in the Q&A that would require platforms to carry content, even of a politician who um, encourages violence or who, or who consistently undermines the integrity of elections. But yeah, these I, I believe that these companies are private entities, just like Fox News or the New York Times. They can decide what content is going to go on their sites. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to stand idly by and say that it's a good thing. You know, we should be condemning it. And if the problem is that these platforms have too much power, then I think the solution is not laws that regulate their content directly, but instead other kinds of laws like privacy laws, which we've already mentioned, but also antitrust laws. Uh, maybe Meta shouldn't be owning Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram. Uh, maybe Google doesn't get to control YouTube and search and all of the other uh, aspects of these companies. Um, wait till Elon Musk takes over Twitter if that actually happens. Um, you know, then uh, you know we'll be in very much the same situation as we see with Zuckerberg, except we'll have someone who's going to be much more public in uh, in his choices. Great. Okay, we're we're going to open up uh, to questions from the audience. I don't see anybody in the queue just yet, um, but queue up and um, uh, Lisa will unmute you so you can ask your question. Uh, can I chime in here? Please. So I, I'd like to ask both of you. Well, first of all, thank you all three of you for a very engaging discussion. Uh, for those who thought the Enlightenment is dead, uh, it's well uh, alive and well here. So thank you to all of you. Uh, I wonder what you all think of uh, Facebook's uh, TV ads calling for uh, government regulation. Well, I can say I think that it's uh, you know very easy to call for regulation um, when you're the biggest player. And uh, a lot of that regulation might be uh, more difficult for your competitors, your small competitors to go after. When you actually look at what Facebook has proposed, it's very skimpy on its specifics. And, uh, you know, it, it really doesn't seem like they've offered anything meaningful uh, that would um, deter any of the worst conduct uh, that we've seen from Facebook in the past. So, sure, please regulate us. It sounds, uh, you know, reasonable, but. You, there's there's no reason to believe that they're either serious about it or that they put forward any proposals that would meaningfully make a difference. Laura, thoughts on that? Um, I don't have anything nice to say. Um, yeah, in all in all seriousness, <laughs> you've already been banned. You know, in all seriousness, I think I think the point that you make about about rent seeking is is right. Um, but I also think that fundamentally, 
for a lot of reasons, we aren't going to get where we're going without the co cooperation of the platforms. And, and that we both need to find ways of getting to a place that is healthier for society, even when that isn't what's best for the platforms. And, and they're gonna say that, and we need to know when we need to push back. But like fundamentally, in, in, any, of, in any of the various proposals that are on the table, most of which you know aren't going to pass into law they are going to require the cooperation of platforms to provide data right to researchers to provide access to researchers all of these things are going to involve working with platforms so i think that we one way or another i think a lot of people think that regulation is coming i think platforms are rightly going to do everything they can to try to make sure that regulation is as beneficial to them as possible. And some of that is gonna have like a, a competitive dimension where the largest platforms are gonna to try to set a high bar so that smaller platforms can't compete. And they're overall going to try to do things that protect their core business as much as they can. And you know, our role in society is to make sure that whatever regulation we wind up with is one that benefits society as a whole. So I think this is this is just one of those places where our incentives are not necessarily aligned. We have to recognize that and still find ways to work together. So Lynn Oberlander has her hand up. Lisa, would you mind unmuting her? Go ahead, Lynn. Hi guys. Um, well, I put it in the chat, but I'll just ask, and I know it's a very basic question, and uh, but I'm wondering if you can still uh, 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 really discuss again why the uh, political advertising requirements for broadcasters, which we've all lived with for a long time, cannot be or should not be or uh, applied to the platforms. And and frankly, you know, I, I, I hear you as, as that you, the problem is not the Washington Post, but why not the Washington Post too? I mean, so, you know, in terms of fairness that everybody has to disclose their, uh, their political advertising. I mean, I can, I can take that one. Um, so, so one, I mean, man, I'm fine with that. That sounds good to me. Um, I do think though, that simply extending is existing regulation, um, to online platforms as for example, the honest ads act would do, um, that is not actually going to get us to where we need to go because while, uh, electioneering ads are important, ads that mention candidates, ads that uh, or, or as a, an issue of national importance in the 90 days prior to an election, all of that is very, very important. Um, when we look at the biggest areas of concern around mis and disinformation, whether it is um, foreign interference in the 2016 election, whether it is all of the misinformation in the last two elections, it very often would not have fallen into that category of electioneering. And so, you know, if, if we're actually gonna study and understand this problem, if journalists are gonna be able to understand who's advertising their communities and write about it, we need broader, we need, we need transparency of a much broader swath of advertising beyond straight electioneering. In particular, we need transparency of social issue advertising, which would, fall into the definition of electioneering about, you know, just about never. So if we're going to understand what most people think about as political ads, we need a broader swath in electioneering ads. Yeah. I, you know, I would say that uh, in the past, the Supreme Court has allowed for regulation for disclosure that goes beyond um, electioneering. And so I'm thinking of the 1954, I think, United States versus Harris case involving lobbying disclosure. That was also a part of the McCain-Feingold um, decision, the, the first one, the McConnell decision, where um, uh, the court upheld uh, laws that required broadcasters to reveal certain information. Um, unfortunately, uh, even though I agree that disclosure of, you know, say, Black Lives Matter or um, abortion or uh, you know, pick your immigration, pick your hot button issue, that that information would be valuable to know. I think the further you get from express advocacy, that is laws that uh, um, ads that expressly advocate the election or defeat of a candidate for office, uh, the further you get from that, the more likely it is that the Supreme Court says this goes too far and chills political engagement and therefore is unconstitutional. And so I think as 
you know, Laura's saying as, you know, as societies, the technology is changing, as society is changing, we need more disclosure. The Supreme Court is moving in precisely the opposite direction. Um, but I thought maybe we want to give Seth a chance to defend the court's decision in McManus because Laura and I aren't, aren't doing it. Seth, feel free to jump in. But while we're waiting on that, I'd have a, a question, um, I, I think, for both of you. So, Rick, a minute ago, well, here, here, Seth, you, you, you defend, and then I'll, I'll ask my question. I see that <laughs> I was you're happy on to let you go first, but uh, well, uh, I'm taking it in a slightly different direction. So, so while, while we're on this, yeah. So, t so to to Lynn's question, I think that the answer is, and this is the answer. When look, we the the state of Maryland argued what Lynn was arguing in the McManus case, and the premise of the argument was that by singling out political advertising for additional disclosure requirements, which didn't just burden the post, but in Maryland applied to a bunch of very small newspapers, you know, the Eastern Eastern Star Democrat, the Cecil County Whig, right? These are tiny newspapers uh, because the thresholds were so low and it was quite burdensome for them to actually mechanically comply with this act. So they brought this challenge, but the, the idea is that if you disfavor political advertising and you impose a bunch of burdens on it, that what you're essentially doing is saying, giving an incentive to uh, the platforms like those newspapers to take advertisements for lawnmowers and uh, cars instead of political advertising. And that sort of turns what we want in the First Amendment sense on its head, right? So um, the... the uh, you know, part of the, the equation there was that, and part of the equation was that the, the evidence that the legislature had relied on was disinformation that had circulated in the 2016 election, of which there was a fair bit of evidence that it had happened on platforms and zero evidence that it had happened in newspapers. So you essentially had two things. One is you had a sort of theoretical First Amendment problem, and then you had a a practical problem, which is that the justification for the, the, the legislation didn't really justify the breadth of it uh, as applied. Um, th as far as the, the issue with broadcasters, broadcasters, as you know, have a uh, much different regulatory environment, rightly or wrongly, uh, based on the rationale of scarcity of broadcast spectrum. And there's not, this was just a question from Judge, uh, Judge Jones in the Fifth Circuit the other day on the, in the a Texas case uh, about whether there is, a, notwithstanding their their rule and allowing the statute to go into effect, uh, that, that essentially said, look, there's not a, a limit on the amount of spectrum, if you will, on the internet, uh, so that uh, you don't have that same justification. And the state, rightly, I thought, for them, pointed out that 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 although there was there was broadcast on the one hand and there was internet on the other hand, the cable, which has historically not been subject to the same scarcity rationale as broadcast, was still uh, subject to the same regulations. And they said, well, this has been going on for a long time. And the point that we made and eventually the court made was that's just the result of nobody in the cable community having uh, challenged it. Uh, and, and as a footnote to our case is when the newspapers won, uh, the broadcasters and the cable companies came in and said, we would like this to apply to us too, because uh, they, they, it was applicable to their websites. And there again had been no evidence that there had been any uh, disinformation circulated through the website of a broadcaster or a cable company as, to, as compared with a social media platform. So well, I don't know if that's persuasive to, 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 to you, but that is the, that is the rationale that the uh, the court did. And it, it raises the question, actually, uh, you know, Alex and I talked a little bit in preparation for today about whether if you had a regulation that required the disclosure of all ads, which is essentially what Laura is uh, proposing and did it above a certain threshold, whether that would be more constitutional, may not be constitutional, but more constitutional than something that singled out only political or social issue advertising, where you don't, you're not making a content distinction, which is burdening a particular class of advertisements. Rick, any thought on that hypothetical law? I mean, on the one hand, it avoids the problem that the McManus decision saw in singling out political ads. On the other hand, it may not be as tailored to the problem that a court might find survives exacting scrutiny. Right. It reminds me of that bar case, uh, the robocall case from, I guess that was a, maybe that's two years ago now, uh, where um, you know, political robocalls were subject to different rules than others. And that was seen as a, uh, than other robocalls. And that was seen as a, uh, content-based restriction and it was subject to strict scrutiny. I mean, you know, maybe the court is relaxing that 
read um, rule about what counts as content regulation. We've got some 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 uh, breadcrumbs this term about that. So you know, I don't know, but I you know that that's why I say. Um, you know, if we couldn't stop micro targeting of political ads, maybe we could stop micro targeting of all ads. Uh, but then that would completely break the business model of these companies. And, you know, it would be an existential fight that hard to see Congress actually doing that, even if that would solve some of the constitutional problems. Uh, you know, if it would mean basically the end of the, the, the advertising model that these companies have. So let, me, let me ask you both a, a slightly different question in a different direction and just picks up um, on a tension that Rick, I, I I think I noticed in the um, answer you gave, and sorry if you hear my son singing in the background. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Rick, a minute ago, you said that you don't trust in the power of counter speech to change people's minds. And this actually, I think, resonates with social science research that suggests that, um, you know, people consume information when it confirms their pre existing beliefs, uh, but, you know, don't change their views in response to you know, factual information that contradicts their beliefs. Um, and, you know, there, that's intention and significant tension, I think, with one of the main ideas of um, uh, your book, that disinformation is a problem that can be solved by improving the quality of information that people see. Um, and, you know, Laura, same question, you know, similar observation to you that the social science on confirmation bias suggests that, you know, the problem of disinformation, you know, uh, is not just a, is not mainly or maybe at all a problem of the quality of information people see, but maybe is a different problem. And I wonder if you could both just speak to this and help us understand what is really the problem we're trying to solve when we talk about disinformation, given this social science research. Well, Alex, the first thing you said is not quite the same thing as the second thing you said. Okay, fair enough. Um, because the first thing you said is something that a lot of science seems to be showing is like, once once a belief takes hold, it's very difficult to change it. And that is different from, you know, this is an information quality problem. I actually think one of the most interesting things that I have learned this year uh, came out of, you know, the first week or two of the, uh, the war in Ukraine, where we saw, frankly, for the first time that I can, that I can think of, we saw a really effective strategy against disinformation play out. And that is when the US government, and this really was very much a strategy that came out of the White House, was very, very aggressive at putting out factual information about what was going on in the ground, on the ground in Ukraine, what was going on in Russia. And this created an, an environment where it's very, very difficult to, you know, for disinformation to take hold. This had a, kind of a general atmospheric component where they were just, hey, this is what we think is happening today. Uh, and then they also specifically pre-bunked, you know, particular narratives. They, they thought, okay, we have information, we have we have intelligence that this thing, that Russia's gonna try this thing, we're gonna tell people Russia's gonna try this thing. And then when Russia tries this thing, nobody believes it. Those were things were really, really effective. And they were effective not as a cure against disinformation, but as a vaccine. I really think this is something that is potentially really, really promising as a, as a, just like something that I want to research, you know, can we create healthier information spaces where there is more, where it is easier to surface accurate information about important questions, like very basic things, like when there will be, when will there be a vaccine for children under five? As a, as a parent of a child under five, I would love to know. And I can't tell you how many times I have gone looking for an answer to that. And the only answers that are available are ones that are not based in fact. And I think, I think this is something that is really, really promising, but is definitely more focused on, on information quality, you know, but isn't really about counter speech. But I'm very curious, Rick, I'm very curious what you think about this. So, uh, you know, I think I agree with much of that and i do think the ukraine information strategy was quite effective but there was an attempt to pre-bunk trump's election lies as well and that didn't work uh in part because i think that was closer to what some people really cared about and they, they were more how effective that was though because i can just tell you that 
I, because I observe this very closely, very often rules around just, just very basic questions like, how will I vote? Those rules were changing, you know, up until like weeks before the election for some people. Sure. Yes. That, was a, that was a circumstance of really serious um, uncertainty. And some of this uncertainty was around communication, but some of it was just like, they don't know because there's an active court case that is unsettled. I think that was really difficult for a lot of people. I think that a lot of places did not get good information out about how people should vote, given everything that was going on. Um, we worked with Common Cause quite a bit on this, where they spent a lot of time just scouring Facebook ads for incorrect election information. And some of it, you know, some of it may have been intentional, but quite a bit of it was unintentional, where uh, county clerks or PACs or all sorts of groups were running ads that would say, you know, this is the deadline to turn in your ballot, or this is a deadline to request a ballot, and they would be wrong. And I think, I think there was so much information flying around. If you were just a person who wants to know how do I vote safely, you were getting a lot of conflicting answers about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. But I think if you take, for example, the question about the likelihood of voter fraud with mail-in ballots, which was Trump's number one uh, issue, uh, there was a, a very deliberate attempt to try to debunk that, and it didn't work. And you know, I would attribute that in part to what I what I would call the demand problem. And so to come back to the but like I, I I absolutely hear you. I cannot tell you, I can I can show you dozens and dozens and dozens of Facebook ads. This is not a matter of demand, right? If if someone's like making an ad, they're paying to show it to people. Ads that were telling people that they couldn't trust mail in balloting, that they could not trust the election. People were spending a lot of money to push that narrative. And I understand that there were people who were also spending money to push the narrative that you could, but this was contested. This was not like uh, they, they, uh, you can trust mail in balloting did not own the information space, not yeah. even close. Yeah, yes, it's, it's true. And so then to come back to Alex's question, what do you do about that? And I would say that you have to recognize that there's a certain percentage of the population that are not going to be reachable. And you have to focus on the center, the people who have not formed opinions. You know, I think a lot of Republicans were open to the idea that there was a problem with how the election was run. Remember, we were doing an election in a pandemic where the rules were changing in part because lots of people were voting by mail and they never did before. And that created a lot of litigation and there, were, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, but, you know, how do you convince those people in the center who have an open mind, who are not running to Truth Social, uh, you know, because they buy into something and then running back to Twitter because there are no liberals to fight with, you know, that that they see this as part of a an information war, but instead they're actually trying to find the truth. So I think giving the voters in the center the ability to find the truth and giving them tools to know, okay, this is an altered video, or to use an example from my book, these people posing as Baptist teetotalers who are trying to tell me that, uh, you know, vote for Roy Moore and we're going to ban alcohol in the state. They're actually liberal Democrats who are trying to suppress my vote. I think people knowing that, they would value that kind of information. You're not going to get everybody, but it's going to have enough of an effect in the center, not at the margins, where it could make a difference. So Rick does still believe in counter speech, at least for some small segment. Sure, yes, okay. but it's not. <laughs> but but you know, but but you need rules that provide um, voters with better tools to be able to get that information because an unregulated market is not going to provide it. Right. Well, what I hear you to be saying, you're both, I think, agreeing on this, is that there's a supply problem, there's a demand problem, and for different segments of society, the problems may be in different magnitudes, and you have to tailor your solutions to, to, to all of those. And I think that's at least helpful as a framework. So we have another question in the queue, so why don't we go to um, David Scover. Lisa, do you mind unmuting him? Yep, go ahead, David. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, I don't see myself on the video. Do you see me? We don't see you, but we're not going to. We're just going to hear you. I think oh, that's right. how it's set up. Right, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I uh, Because of the time difference between the West and East Coast, I may have gotten the wrong time. And so I didn't hear uh, your fine presentations from the very beginning. But And thus, uh, this question may, in fact, have been discussed and answered at some point. So if so, I, I, I apologize. But in, in what I have been able to hear, it seems to me 
that and, and Rick, you may have in fact just answered my question to some degree by talking about the center as opposed to the uh, either extreme. Uh, but it seems to me that the, the the major one of the major problems that really you know will prevent much uh, of a cure, whether, whether you try to regulate or find another effective. Uh, uh, remedy for disinformation is just the siloing effect of media. The siloing effect of media is so dramatic uh, that has been uh, shown in study after study, and there and I just I I don't know whether it is conceivable that that one really reaches uh, groups that are disinclined to believing. The um, the quote unquote truth that you're trying to give them anyhow. So I mean, un, un, until the, I think disinformation is almost a natural phenomenon of siloing. If you are only getting one side of of a debate continuously, even if they're not lying to you, you are you are disinformed. Right, you uh, by by definition, you are not hearing all sides. So I I just don't know what. I mean, how are you going to cope with the siloing effect in in terms of disinformation or warfare? Let me just add one gloss on this. Thanks, David, for that question. Let me add one gloss on this, which is a new story that I had not seen, but that Seth uh, shared with me in the background. Just so you all know, um, uh, a story that points to a study that publishes results in April where uh, a few hundred Fox News watchers were paid uh, to watch CNN for, I think, a month. And right. the result of the study was that uh, some not insignificant number of people changed their minds on um, seeming, you know, some major issues. So, Rick, what do you think? Well, first, I'd say that, I, you know, the siloing in social media, the evidence is and Laura can speak to this better, is is less certain on how much siloing is actually going on around a lot of people. But I think on television, cable television, we do have this Fox News effect for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then, you know, I, I would just, since, since we're almost out of time, let me just make kind of a more general point about this, which is um, the Supreme Court should recognize that um, the media environment and the political information environment has changed so much that laws that try to give voters a chance to get reliable information from alternative sources should be subject to maybe lesser scrutiny or maybe subject to you know a different balancing test given that you know the, the main um interest here is you know it's, it's the worry the main worry is not preventing government censorship but giving voters the tools they need to be active citizens in a in, in a in a society that's committed to both free elections and robust free speech. And so how you achieve that balance, I think, is difficult. But the kinds of laws that the Supreme Court might, for example, in the past have said should not be allowed because they are content based or whatever the rule is going to be, I think that should change. And the last point, and I'll turn to Laura, is that um, the justices themselves, and I made this point in a law review article I wrote a couple of years ago, are themselves in their silos. So uh, uh, Justice Scalia used to talk about listening to talk radio is where he got all of his information. And it's pretty clear that, you know, what what um, what uh, a um, Justice Alito is consuming for his media diet and what Justice Kagan is consuming for her media diet are probably pretty different, and they affect the decisions that the Supreme Court itself makes. Laura, do you want to final thoughts before we turn it over to Ron to close out the event? I would say just just an answer to that question. Um, things are not better online. I think platforms. One of the things we have seen about content recommendation algorithms is that they tend to drive users toward more polarized content. Um, and I think that again is is the incentive problem in a nutshell. That is a real is a real societal problem. So, um, I but I know we're out of time, and and I've sort of said that a few times now about the this incentive problem really being the the nut we have to crack.
So at the risk of just going over a couple of minutes, I would like the three of you to respond to the following quotation from a man named Louis Brandeis, the statement he made in 1927. And just briefly, I would like to hear your views as to whether or not you agree or disagree or what your views are on the following statement. Freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. We can start maybe with Alex, then go to Laura, and we'll let, uh, uh, we'll close with um, some comments from the author of Cheap Speech, which is what all brought us together today. So Alex? I don't know what you can say um, in response to a, a Brandeis quote, except to agree wholeheartedly. Absolutely. And, and the question, the, the challenge I think we face today is uh, we aren't equipping and we aren't putting people in a position uh, to uh, think as they will um, so, so that they can uh, enact their visions of society into law uh, free from the distortions of uh, the environment around them. And I think that's one of the central challenges that we're, we've been discussing today. Laura, so, yes. Thank you. Laura? Like Alex, I think that's a quote that's impossible to disagree with. But I think that in the face of, of a lot of content online, it's, it's almost orthogonal, right? What does it matter, your philosophical opinions about a consumer fraud scam that someone is advertising to you? Um, what do you know? What about the again, like we're getting into your philosophical opinions about uh, the 5G chip in your vaccine? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of this, the the philosoph philosophizing that some of sometimes we get stuck in, it assumes that everyone has time to sit and think rationally about all claims and evaluate them based on factualness. And that's not that's not the world we live in. That's not the world we spend our time in online. And that's why I think that as much as that is, again, absolutely true, a thing I 100% agree with, we also have to think about how we can build safe systems for people looking at cat videos. And, and I, I would just say, L Laura uh, expressed my views. I'm, I, I guess I'm going to push back on Brandeis. He also said sunlight is the best disinfectant and, you know, uh, I'll take um, an anti something that's antibacterial uh, any day over sunlight as a disinfectant. Um, voters are swimming upstream. They are being flooded with lots of false claims. They're being flooded with things that are trying to push their emotional buttons rather than to get them to think rationally. And in this world, that this new world we're living in, we have to think about how to give voters the tools to be able to separate what's true from what's not true. And um, we require not only that legislators figure out how to deal with this and give us the tools to keep our democracy going, but that courts also recognize this changed environment and that the First Amendment needs to change with it. Niccolo Machiavelli, who was not Louis Brandeis, once said, "I will. others will tell you what the world should be, but I will tell you what it is. I think today we've heard uh, both about what the world should be and what it is. And I want to thank on behalf of all of us at the Salon, uh, Alex, Laura, and Rick uh, for this uh, very enlightening discussion. And it is precisely that kind of discussion that those of us who believe in the future of the First Amendment uh, and in the future of reason, it is precisely such discussions that make that hope possible. So thank you all and thank you to our audience. and. Uh, in about a week or so, we will have the video of this uh, posted on the Salon's website. So for all of us uh, at the Salon, thank you very much. We very much appreciate your participation.